Good afternoon. It's Tuesday, March 12. I'm Herman Green with your midday news. A special welcome for those of you watching online at onespotmedia.com. A justice of the peace is this afternoon raising concerns about some aspects of the road improvement works along the Mandela Highway in San Andrew. Meanwhile, more pipeline works by the National, work, the National Water Commission crew is causing even more traffic nightmares and dangers to pedestrians. TVJ's Krista Campbell has the details. Headache for motorists, danger for pedestrians. This is the daily reality for persons using the Washington Boulevard to Mandela Highway stretch in St. Andrew. Road conditions have been made worse since the National Water Commission's recent temporary pipeline activities. The NWC says the latest work is to provide some relief to customers in the corporate area who have been without piped water since the Commission's 18-inch pipeline broke last December. NWC's corporate public relations manager, Charles Buchanan, says the permanent pipeline is still being installed and should be complete by this July. He says it will feature 24 and 33-inch pipes, which will expand the previous water supply in the corporate area. Meanwhile, Justice of the Peace, Emmanuel Borland, has other concerns about the road improvement project along the Mandela Highway. He says in some instances, the road work has prevented proper access to critical buildings. You don't block off police station. Pollution is blocked off right now with a little alley to go in there. You don't block off schools. The Heidel group of schools is another one that is all blocked off. In fact, you don't block off parish churches, schools, fire stations, and so on, and go out there and look. As far as I'm concerned, the road is a mess. The road is spoilt, and I, I, I can't see how it is going to survive for the next 40, 50 years. I can't see it. The National Works Agency says the $64 million U.S. dollar Mandela Improvement Project is about 90% complete. It was initially supposed to be finished by the end of 2018, but that timeline was extended to the first quarter of this year, which ends in another two weeks. The road infrastructure legacy projects fall under the government's major infrastructure development program, which is being financed through a concessionary loan from the government of the People's Republic of China. Krista Campbell, TVJ News. Fears this afternoon that the number of illegal vendors on the streets of Kingston and St. Andrew could increase due to the displacement of their colleagues at the Constant Spring Market. At least one vendor who faced the mayor and his team at a tour of the facility made it clear he is going on the roads to sell his goods. More in this report from TVJ's Dwayne Anderson. On Saturday, demolition crews from the National Works Agency leveled the Constant Spring Market in St. Andrew. This marked the end for the 40-year-old facility that even court action failed to save. Now, the more than 60 registered vendors who used the facility will have to find new places to sell their goods. As difficult as it is for them, they understand the greater good and the, oh, this is important to the city. For me, it's, it's a good sign. It's, it's a sign of the maturing of our, our society and a level of maturity that must be pleasing. But at least one vendor made it clear he's planning to go on the streets. What do you mean, me can't go on the road? Yeah, but the, the full case man now have them kind of problem. Mm. All right, so you're clear, me that you can't you're not go clear, on the road. You're not clear, you're not saying you have them problem. Kingston's Mayor Delroy Williams said most of the vendors were optimistic about finding suitable places to continue their business. They were able to build a life and a, a proper financial base from being here and now they are looking to, they understand what, what is going on and now they are looking to other parts to continue their business and are, and are very optimistic, very optimistic about it. And I know that development must take place. All we wanted was for you know, a civil discussion to take place and we'll come to an amicable agreement. Well, we have come to some form of agreement, but you know, it's not as what we probably would have wanted, but we still that the case is for even considering us. The space previously occupied by the Constant Spring Market was identified by authorities for use in the road expansion taking place in Kingston and St. Andrew. Dwayne Anderson, TVJ News. On the political scene, the two main candidates for the upcoming Portland Eastern by-election continue to push plans and ideas in an effort to shore up support. 
The by-election is set for April 4, with both the PNP's Damian Crawford and the GLP's Anne-Marie Vaz campaigning on one common platform, education. On Sunday, Mr. Crawford told supporters in Prospect that, having experienced the benefits of a good education himself, he wants others to benefit as well. Pointing to plans for new hotels in Portland, he says his plan is to equip persons at all levels for job opportunities when they arise. And when the hotel done built, let them know front decks will be here and prepared, accounts will be here and prepared, housekeeping will be here and prepared. And that is why we have to start from literacy. Because when you check it out, CXC man is getting pushed out by university man. University people, the CXC people work. And therefore, CXC people start the reading people work. So reading people, the can't read people work, can't read people have no work. Also on Sunday, the GLP's Anne-Marie Vaz told supporters in Montchenil that despite her own educational background, her focus has always been on helping others with their studies. I was too poor to afford a tertiary in education. So you know what I did? I formed my One Jamaica Foundation for over five years. I have raised the education level in East Portland, Portland in general, right? Because education is critical to your success. I come here to work for JLP, PNP, or no P. I am here to work for the people of East Turn Portland. Residents of one Clarendon community are this afternoon calling for the deplorable road conditions and insufficient water supply in their area to be addressed urgently. They say it's impacting their main mean of survival, agriculture. The issues were discussed at a recent town hall session in the parish, as TVJ's O'Shane Masters now reports. Poor infrastructure and water supply. Residents of the Clarendon community of Kellitz say those are the two main issues that's affecting agriculture in the area. The people contend that they've been living with the issues for some time and accept that it may take a while for the authorities to finally address them. So, in the interim, they say they're doing what they can to empower their women. And we'll be giving a grant to some of those vulnerable women who have been left to, to, to take care of their children by themselves. So we are giving persons a small grant. 25 persons will be trained starting tomorrow. We're going to be taking them through business development. So we don't want to get the chicken and yummy off. We don't want to take the chicken them and give it away. We want you to approach it like a business and pay yourself and become independent. In the meantime, National Integrity Action Outreach Officer Gavin Myers insists that the government must create a better environment for farmers. Between 10 and 15 percent of Jamaica's population are farmers. And if you come from any parish outside of Kingston and St. Andrew, that means that somewhere close to 20 percent of the people who live and work in any one of those parishes are farmers. But even more, the greater percentage of our GDP that come from primary products, agriculture, mining, or fisheries, is the greatest. It's a great, it forms over a third of our GDP. Only tourism comes close to that. And even a part of tourism product is farming. Machine Masters, TVJ News. The cruise ship passenger killed yesterday afternoon in Ocheria, St. Anne, has been identified as 60-year-old Mark Johnson from California in the United States. Reports are that minutes after two, Mr. Johnson was walking from Duns River Falls with his spouse heading to the cruise ship. It's understood that when he reached an area called Bull Point, he was hit by a passenger bus. He was rushed to the St. Anne's Bay Regional Hospital where he was pronounced dead. His spouse was not hurt. The driver of the bus is to be interviewed by the police. In the wake of the Ethiopian Airlines crash on Sunday, the Jamaica Civil Aviation Authority says it's monitoring airlines which service routes to the island using Boeing's new 737 MAX 8 aircraft. The Ethiopian airline was operating one of the planes when tragedy struck. 
It was en route from Addis Ababa to the Kenyan capital, Nairobi, when it crashed six minutes after takeoff. Several airlines have grounded the Boeing model following the disaster. TVJ News sought an update from Director General of the Jamaica Civil Aviation Authority, Nari Williams Singh. Anytime there's a, an, an occurrence of this type, you know, we certainly want to, to be aware of what may be contributing factors or probable causes. Aviation safety is certainly paramount for us. Um, there are some air operators that have these type of aircraft in their fleet. There's the operators that operate into Jamaica. Meanwhile, overseas, the Federal Aviation Administration is now responding to growing concerns over Boeing 737 MAX 8. Tragedy in the sky sparks a dire warning from aviation experts. I've never said that, hey, it's unsafe to fly a particular model of aircraft, but in this case, I'm going to have to go there. So, yeah. I would watch for that airplane. Multiple airlines around the world are grounding Boeing 737 MAX 8 planes following a second crash in less than six months. Two major U.S. airlines, Southwest and American Airlines, fly the MAX 8 and say they will continue to do so for now, leaving some passengers uneasy. People were nervous. Uh, reading a lot of reading uh, on the paper and also on uh, the internet. The FAA says it's too early to tell whether the two crashes are linked. However, they're ordering Boeing improve the flight control systems on the MAX 8 and 9 by next month. We already have we, uh, the, the return flight booked, so uh, if we could change it without any fee, I guess we would do it. Passengers scheduled to fly on MAX 8s in the U.S. do not have many options. The airlines are making no adjustments to their changing cancellation policies. News back home, organizers of the annual peace initiative, the 10,000 Men March, Bishop Rowan Edwards, is urging residents to lobby for the removal of the prison in the old capital. Addressing the march on Sunday, he noted that the prison was originally built for slaves and would serve a better purpose if used for something else. They can you imagine if we move that prison? But what would happen in Spanish Town? Because we would now have tourists coming in here to look at where the slaves used to be kept, to look at the gangman news. I'm begging Jamaicans to start lobbying, begging Spanish Tonians to start lobbying for that prison to be removed. Let's push it out somewhere else and let this place look good. Prime Minister Andrew Holness promised to consider the bishop's suggestion, even as he announced development plans for the old capital. There are not many towns within the Caribbean that has the architecture, Victorian and later, that Spanish town has. And it is a sad thing to see it deteriorating and the citizens not getting the full value of the history. There's been a resurgence of crime, particularly murders in Spanish Town, since the recent end of the state of public emergency. The march is one of several initiatives aimed at reducing crime and gang warfare in the old capital to allow youngsters in the parish to the opportunity to succeed. Meanwhile, two of them, Latifa Coleman and Israel Burnett, were awarded for their academic achievements at Sunday's march. We go now to news in sports as with Cricket West Indies presidential elections less than two weeks away, Jamaica's votes could be the deciding factor in the race between incumbent David Cameron and challenger Ricky Skerritt. Daniel Blake explains why. In 2017, Jamaican Dave Cameron secured a third term as president of Cricket West Indies after going unopposed. But this time around, the 47-year-old will be challenged by 62-year-old Ricky Skerritt, who is a former team manager of the West Indies and the current president of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Cricket Association. With a total of 12 votes, with two going to each of the six member territories, the cricket boards of Guyana, Barbados and the Windward Islands have revealed they will back Cameron. But the Leeward Islands and Trinidad and Tobago are expected to vote for Skerritt after supporting his nomination. Only the Jamaica Cricket Association hasn't announced who they will support in the election. Cameron announced recently that he will be holding a town hall meeting on March 21 in Kingston, three days before the election, to make a presentation to President Wilford Billy Heaven and the JCA. And Skerritt is also expected to arrive in the island soon as he looks to take the Jamaica vote. 
Heaven recently said he would listen to both candidates and not just vote for Cameron because he was Jamaican. The presidential election will take place during the Cricket West Indies annual general meeting on March 24 at the Jamaica Pegasus Hotel in Kingston. Daniel Blake, TVJ Sports. And that's the Midday News. I'm Herman Green. Please join us at 7 for the Primetime News Package. On behalf of the news sports and production teams, good afternoon.